Now to end it, to end this lovely show today, I'm going to cover this topic because I feel like this is one of the most funniest headlines I've seen in a long, long time. And it concerns one of my favourite people in streetwear, bitch, you guessed it, Tremaine Emery. Tremaine Emery somehow said one of the most craziest sentences I've heard in my entire life. And I heard, look, looked at his headline online. I saw it late on Twitter and I legitimately was crying laughing when I saw this headline. Headline courtesy of Complex. Converse didn't want Denim Tears to do a watermelon sneaker. So Tremaine is not content with having chicken bone necklaces. He's not content with having uh, watermelon on his t-shirts, hot wing hoodies. I don't know what else he's fucking doing out there, right? Uh, he's, not con he's not content with con constantly reminding people <laughs> about slavery on his clothes. Now he's hell-bent on these racial and somewhat racist motifs uh, being adorned on fucking sneakers. He wants his next Converse collaboration to now be covered and adorned in watermelons. And it was fucking hilarious when I saw the headline. And I now want to listen to the actual clip because this was part of a conversation he had with Rick Rubin. He sat down with a podcast with Rick Rubin. They spoke about, you know, his career and whatnot. And it got into a topic about, you know, collaborations and shit. And he kind of divulged some stuff about a collaboration that was meant to happen with Converse, but didn't happen because he wanted to put watermelons all over the sneaker. And I guess Converse were like, hey, we love you, but fuck no, we're not getting involved in this fucking conversation. So that headline was all over social media myself other people were fucking laughing about it but i'm assuming a lot of tremaine haters were also using it as a chance to fucking hit him over the head and say hey you're charging people 800 dollars for fucking chicken wing necklaces and shit you're kind of you know you're, you're basically um you know shucking and jiving for the dollar out there and making a mockery out of our pain out of our suffering and shit for profit we hate you so he decides to jump on social media and defend himself. And I'm so pissed he deleted it. But Tremaine posted two pictures of like watermelon sneakers that Converse did in the past. And then the captions are fucking funny. Like you're like, oh, I've read 150 books. Da -da -da -da. I don't know. He was, he was wiling out, right? And the replies, they were ripping into him. The replies were destroying him, but he didn't delete the two posts. So I'm so gutted I didn't fucking take screenshots of it. But Tremaine was going crazy on the timeline, really like not, you know, really not reading the room and shit. But then he did post these pictures of these other watermelon sneakers that Converse did in the past to sort of like justify why it's okay for his brand that's steeped in, you know, um, what's it called? Um, it's a black diaspora brand or whatever the message is, right? Or some people are referring to it as a slavery brand. He's somehow relating the fact that he went through watermelon sneakers the same way as these nondescript generic watermelon Converse shoes that they did in the past, right? Converse, which is absolutely two different things. But regardless, I wanted to play the clip itself to hear exactly what Tremaine said. And let's hear how he explains why Converse didn't want to do watermelon um, adorned Converse sneakers with him after, again, you have to imagine, after a very politically, no, after, after a very charged pair of first Converse sneakers that he did, where he had the flag on there, um, and that was a collaboration that nearly didn't see the light of day, finally got over the line because... Tremaine kind of aired them out and maybe they felt bad because of Black Lives Matter and shit, but they did the right thing in the end. To then come back and double back and then do watermelon sneakers is fucking cheeky and it's fucking wild. <laughs> to be honest, right? After you had such a hard time making Converse be okay with um, the first fucking Converse shoes that he did, right? Which, you know, in retrospect were fairly inoffensive, um, but Converse weren't really too pleased or weren't really on board with putting these out in the first place, right? The first ones that he put out, right? But they eventually he did do the right thing so the fact that he wanted to then try his luck and push the fucking watermelon things is fucking wild but let's hear what he has to say let's hear Tremaine talking to Rick Rubin about Converse not wanting to do watermelon sneakers let's fucking go I won't be able to be the best husband or father if I'm not fulfilled okay. same for Andy same for McCoy same for everyone you know okay. so that is important but not at the expense of in my opinion what I've time with people you love you know yeah you know what we talked about fear a lot it put not the fear of death for me it put the fear of not spending that what i feel is an adequate amount of time with people i i respect that care about and love understood that's so because before i never feared death come like why would i i'm like it's gonna happen and the way my parents raised me 
but I still don't fear death, but I fear not having enough time with Andy. Yeah. You know what's funny about he says that? Because I think Andy is his wife. Um, he recently got married, so congratulations to Tremaine. But I think the funny thing about it when he says that is that I'm always reminded of Virgil. That was the thing that was so heartbreaking when the Virgil Abloh passed away. God bless the dead. Because obviously, you know, spent having spent some time with Virgil when I was doing that streetwear course and I was kind of, you know, uh, programming that online course for up and coming streetwear brands and shit. And I got to kind of speak to him a few times and I got to actually work, you know, with him and put kind of put some of those tutors together. One of the things that I realized quite quickly when I spent time with him was that he does spend a lot of time not with his family. He does spend a lot of time around randoms, right? Around clout chasers, around people trying to get their, you know, get their foot on the ladder, just around, reg you know, random people, basically. And his entire career was spent on a plane, jetting from Chicago to Paris to Milan to New York, all over the place, right? He literally used planes like fucking Ubers and stuff, right? He was a consummate fucking professional, super hard worker. I never heard him complain, not even fucking once during the time I was with him, especially when we had to have him kind of flying all over the place to fucking do things for us and whatever it may be. But one of the things that really kind of broke my heart when he passed away, I was like, shit, man. I bet his family must feel so conflicted because they never really had to have a lot of like time with him as a dad, as a father, so as, as a father, um, as a husband, as a partner, right? As a son, they never really got, as a brother, they never really got time to spend with him alone until the end of his life when obviously he was getting more real and he had to kind of stay at home and shit. That's the only time they had to spend time with him. And by then he probably, I guess, probably wasn't maybe the same person or whatever it may be. I'm not really too sure. I wasn't there regardless, but... That was the main thing that kind of really troubled me when he passed. It's like, fuck, man. He gave way more to us people, randoms in the world, in his last years of his life than probably he gave to his family. Because that last five to ten year run of Virgil was insane, right? He went on a run. Like, he went on a run when he started off-white until he got, like, you know, until he got the Louis, v Louis Vuitton job, where he was just, like, Boom, boom, collab, collab, drop, 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 event, event, DJ, DJ. Like he was going crazy. The amount of work he was putting out there, but something had to give. And I'm assuming, you know, seeing his family was the thing that probably had to give. I'm assuming not seeing his wife as often as he probably wanted, not seeing his mom and dad as often as he wanted. That's a really heartbreaking thing about being successful or about chasing your dreams, right? About feeling like you have a purpose and, you know, you're here for a reason and shit. Then other things kind of fall by the wayside and then, you know, you end up kind of losing a lot of time that you usually can't get back. So that's a really hard thing to kind of wrangle when you're kind of going for your dreams. Like you have to be kind of conscious of that, you know, some things are going to give and it might be things that you can't necessarily get back, such as time. Because she's like the most amazing, one of the most amazing people I've ever met. So I have that fear and the way I meet that fear is by letting her know how much I value her what she's done for me and even let her know what she means to me and then um spending time having fun just great yeah so great. that's that's what i learned same thing with mccoy same thing with a side same thing with frazier and david chris the friends you know even like with you you know it's like we're cool man hey yo big up uh coiler no 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 the the, the free course isn't online it was it was with a company called mastered um most of the videos that i helped put together because the videos i've got on my channel are the ones that i was responsible for kind of you know curating um because i was the ones that picked the fucking course people that were on it like hype plan and stuff so it's, that's why i'm really proud of hype plan because hype plan was on that course that i was um that i kind of helped to kind of put together the curriculum for um he was one of the quote unquote students so to see hype plan doing what he's doing now is fucking brilliant so all those all those videos that you see of virgil mentoring certain brands i was the one responsible for putting those videos together i didn't record them obviously but i put those you know people together and shit and kind of specked out what they'll be talking about how the review would be going how the review would go in terms of the portfolio review in terms of the brand review so that's most of the that's the that's the most of the that's the that's the real meat and potato of the course so if you have a brand if you're thinking of starting a brand watch those videos and that will tell you most of what you need to know the rest of it is just like you know stuff that you probably don't really care about but the the rest of it is the most of it oh yeah essence raw yeah exactly exactly that's how i met exactly big up essence raw yes 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 exactly you know big up you 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 know those those master days were real big up essence raw he was there he was in the field he was in the field in the field big up essence raw bang your chest brother and like i could see someone that i'm really cool with a friend and it's like you know what i was like 
I'm gonna hit Rick when I'm in LA. Yeah. And if we can meet up, we can meet up. Yeah. So might not see you for a year again. Maybe we'll never see each other again. But we made time to see each other on this one, like we've done in the past. So that's what I try to do. You can't see everyone all the time, but within reason I rotate it and then I have my you know, my main concern is is Andy. That's my number one thing. Do you think of yourself as a spiritual person? I don't, but then even what I'm about to say, my kids, some could say could be considered spiritual. I think life is meaningless and we put the meaning, you put the meaning into it. And then you're like loved ones that you think you want to give to meaning to life. So I agree with maybe that. that is spiritual. I agree with that. I'm not real read in all the religions, but I know stuff mm -hmm. from some, from, you know, the Bible, from Buddhism, Joseph Campbell, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> Miyamoto Musashi, Five Rings, The Book of Five Rings, Tao, Jeet Kune Do, can go on and on, comic books. That's what I see, you know, those are, those, are those are biblical to me, comic books, that's stuff I've learned. You learn from comic books, you know, like the X-Men, Professor X was based off Martin Luther King and Magneto was based off Malcolm X. And it was a Trojan horse to tell that story through these mutants. We were kings. We were kings, right? <laughs> Black people create everything. <laughs> the pyramids, the modern banking structure. We were the basis of the X-Men. <laughs> I love Tremaine, man. We were kings. We were kings. We were the first mutants. We were the first mutants, okay? The first comic book superhero was fucking the Black Panther, okay? Wakanda forever. Wakanda is actually a real place. It's in Johannesburg. That's Wakanda. <laughs> and so the mutants represented African Americans in America. You know what I mean? So I've learned more from that than I learned from the Bible. Mm. But just only because I've read more, I've read more comic books than I've read the Bible. So you know, I'm agnostic, and when people hear that, I think they think atheist, and it's not. I don't subscribe to any religion, mm. or that there's an omnipotent being. With human, or, or that there's not or that there's not yeah mm -hmm. or that that omnipotent being has human traits because mm -hmm. that's the thing about humans we're like humans as a whole we're narcissists and we're like you know it's like someone sees an alien it kind of looks human yeah and like when we look it? at clouds we see faces we yeah. see faces because it's like you know whereas does a dog see a face in a cloud no maybe probably not i'll tell you this i felt spiritual the first time i saw the sun after being in the ICU for a month. Yeah. I realized that the sun that I hadn't seen in a month from being in my hospital room and the sun that I thought I never was gonna see again yeah. was the same that sun that shined on every living being that, everything that's lived in the Milky Way, the, mm. this universe, this, uh, our mm. galaxy, the earth, the dinosaurs, my mom who's no longer here. Same mm. sun. The same sun, it sh shined on every living organism that has ever spurned from the earth to the last one the sun that same sun that i hadn't saw that i took for granted yeah i felt that connection when i felt the sun in my wheelchair with my shades on and i took my shades off and I started crying chris was there and my other friend chris was there i remember you know texting andy the picture and my dad so, I guess I am spiritual. It must have been pretty wild, though, isn't it? Imagine the fear that you have, because, you know, Tremaine, I think, was ill just around the same time that Virgil passed away. So, you imagine how scary that must have been. Your best friend passes away, and then you have this debilitating illness where you're nearly on death's, where you're at, at death's door. That must have been fucking scary also, because you think, fuck, now my time is up as well, and I haven't done anything I wanted to do just yet. You're like, shit. That's the, the way the way life comes at you is fucking crazy, isn't it? One minute you're all fucking popping bottles in Paris, fashion week and shit, celebrating your friend becoming the fucking creative director of Louis Vuitton. The next minute you're at his funeral, and then the next minute you're on a fucking hospital bed. Yikes. Maybe not by the textbook definition. Definitely. You know, for me, my religion, like, I find religion in people. You know, like uh, people that I connect with. I find religion and like, and the relationship. Mm. So I found religion and relationship with A side. 
I've found religion in my relationship with my friend Frazier. And I think I've found my highest religion in my relationship with Andy. So I guess religion ultimately is about connection. Yeah. That's yeah. what it is. Yeah, yeah, connection. You know, well, though, the one thing I'll say, which hasn't been said about the whole thing with me and Supreme, when I really think about it and, and a friend, my friend Jim. I'm not going to lie. Hopefully he says something good here because he's been pretty... I loved how he's kind of had a little bit more time to think about the Supreme thing. And the last interview that I watched where he was sitting down with that Angelo back guy from Awake, he did sound quite grown up and he did take some level of accountability because I thought that was the one thing that just was so annoying when he was first moaning about the Supreme thing. Yes, shit goes wrong. We all know it. Yes, sometimes things can be unfair. But based on the information we have available, based on what he said, based on the statements that Supreme put out, read between the lines, it sounds like both sides had a part to play in that not working out. But the way Tremaine was crying about it, it made it seem as if like Supreme were out here like the fucking Ku Klux Klan. Do you know what I mean? It's like, come on, brother. Yes, they might not be as progressive as they purport to be. Cool. But let's not make it out as if like you were working for fucking, you know, Antifa or something. Do you know what I mean? Let's fucking relax. Let's fucking relax. So I was happy to hear him be a little bit more mature grown up and chilled out about the whole thing and actually be a bit more grown up about the situation and now that some time has passed and maybe he's become a bit more even way more successful than he was prior to taking supreme joker that's a good thing as well his career and them tears has only gone up right since that time so maybe that you know maybe wiping your tears with a couple hundred dollar bills or knowing that your brand is now established and you got a real demand out there for you in the streets and shit. I saw recently a fucking picture or a video of a, of somebody that fucking vinyl wrapped their car in, you know, um, what you call it? Um, the cotton reef design of, of Denim Tears all over their fucking uh, pickup truck. No, on the SUV, sorry, right? It's not even a nice SUV. I think it was like a random like Toyota or something. I was like, shit, somebody put that all over a fucking Land Cruiser or whatever it may be. So clearly his brand's going great. So I'll hope, hopefully in this segment, he doesn't say anything fucked up about Supreme. And he doesn't go back to being the victim again. Let's see what he says. Let's see how he kind of, you know, talks about the Supreme situation. Jimmy illuminated to me, to me was the issue between me and Supreme was I don't really get uncomfortable about talking about anything. And the top brass there was uncomfortable to talk to me about that imagery. And yeah, but that's the thing, you see? I see what he's saying, but that's the issue. When you work in a corporation, you have to d conduct yourself differently. There is a professional way of conducting yourself and professional way of talking to your colleagues. Unfortunately, I think for him, he has his own brand that's very successful where he does everything. He is the main honcho. He's the one that founded it. It's his baby. He can do it. He can say and does whatever he pleases. So how he conducts himself with his own brand, he thought he could transpose that into working at Supreme. It's not the same thing. He's yo, it's so, it's so, and maybe he thought also because of the store and because of the people that he knows behind the scenes, he assumed the office culture will be the same. But clearly, from what it's from what he's talking about and reading between the lines, it sounds like the supreme working culture. Maybe because of the brand, is it? In, I forgot who the brand is that bought them, but maybe because the brand that bought Supreme, I'm not sure. Maybe because of how it was before, but it seems like the office culture in Supreme is more similar to like a regular corporation then it is like a startup, then it is like a small DIY brand where everyone's kind of like, ha ha, he he, music, play. like, it's not, it's just like a regular office. So I think he just hasn't been used to being in a regular work environment in a while because he's been doing his own thing for a long time and he didn't know how to conduct himself. But I don't think that is a, an issue of, uh, oh, because I'm just comfortable about talking about things and I'm the most comfortable, you know, I don't, I don't have a filter. It's more so because he didn't have to conduct himself in a pressure environment. And then I guess in the Supreme side of things, the things they got wrong, there's that they didn't tell him the expectations of what they, they, they didn't tell him what they expected of him in the workplace. You know what I mean? They just let him kind of do his thing. And then they weren't mad enough to kind of pull him to a side and say, hey, you're doing this and this wrong. They just kind of let it kind of play out. And obviously the, by that time, the relationship already crumbled and it kind of ended how it ended. That's my interpretation. I could be wrong, but that's my interpretation. And then wanting to change it out or not use it. And when people get uncomfortable and have fear gets in them, that's when mistakes and miscommunications and and feelings and sh you know shit goes awry and you know they they didn't I guess they just didn't have it in them to even have the conversation which is all again go back to the converse thing 
the discourse. Because <laughs> even, you asked me if I ever have been censored, yes. There was another show I was going to do at Converse with uh, my friend, artist Dan Colin. And he has a farm called Sky. Oh, Dan Colin was involved. Yeah, big up Dan Colin. Dan Colin's the original. Original. Um, oh, what, the, what were they fucking called? What were they fucking called the name of them? But that was during the time when Aaron Bondaroff was around. That was during the time when Dashna was around. Um, Dan Cullen is more famous known for the candle, the, the, the candle, the candle painting. It's an amazing uh, painting. It's mostly in blue, in oil paint of a candle, and the flame is just—it's just about it's about to go out, and there's smoke billowing. It's an amazing, massive, big piece. Um, he also done what else did he do? I don't think no, he didn't do bird's nest. I think um, Dash No did bird nest. That amazing uh, piece where it was like a big white room and it was all covered in fucking um, bits of paper mache and stuff. I don't know, bits of paper. I think newspapers that was kind of shredded and it was almost like a bird's nest. It was all flying around the place and they did like live band shows and stuff and there, whatever it mean. But Dan Cullen is an original member of that kind of downtown Lower East Side art crew from back in the day that I remember kind of following online for a lot of time. And I think he recently got sober and then opened up that farm that also does merch and shit and whatever it may be. And I think they put out some boots recently as well. I think they call like Sky High something farm. I forgot what they called. So, but yeah, but big up Dan Cullen. Absolute legend in the scene. Tower for him. And we're exploring stuff with food and design and black food. So we're going to do a converse of a watermelon rind. <laughs> the skin of a watermelon. So converse <laughs> felt that was controversial. <laughs> and they thought it could be... Converse thought it was controversial. No, we all thought it was controversial, brother. Not only Converse, everybody thought it was controversial. Imagine, after coming off the back of what he's coming off the back of, he wants to now do a <laughs> Converse with watermelon. By the way, this is the this is the Dan Colin painting. I don't know if you can see it there, right? What is it? It's Dan Colin. What is, what's, what's the painting called? Yeah, that's the one. That's my favorite Dan piece, uh, Dan Colin piece. What's it called? It's called whatever. Oil on canvas. That is fucking gorgeous, man. Look at that. What a beautiful painting. One of my favorite ever, Dan, P Dan Colin. That's a really, really good piece. So, yeah. Big up, Dan Colin. Absolute fucking legend. Interpreted as racist, right? Because of menstrual imagery in the past of blacks and watermelons. I'm assuming they thought it was racist more so because, you know what they thought? Was, you know what's funny about this? I'm assuming Converse were a bit edgy and a bit nervous about doing a collaboration not because of the watermelon minstrel history but more so because of denim tears and the brand and what he basically pushes out there right because it's mostly a brand that talks about the black struggle in a weird way right it's not really but it kind of is a you know a a, a brand where he's not afraid to talk about you know racial issues and shit so i'm assuming they fought it would hit way worse with it being Denim Tears and with the controversy that they did in the past than it would just being an isolated Converse collaboration with some watermelons on it. I don't think they have an, I don't think they have an issue making Converses that just have watermelons all over the shoes because clearly they did it in the past, right? They've done it in the past. They can do this, but they just don't want to do it with him because they know how it would look and they don't want that smoke. Why would you want that smoke for free? Makes no sense. He's just doing it by himself. I think Tremaine is already at a level now, or Denim Tears is at a level now, where they should be able to make their own shoes. I know shoes are the most expensive thing to make or to manufacture or to produce in the clothing industry world. Um, but if this is the place that he's at now, where all these brands don't want to particularly have these racy images attached to their, or, you know, inspirations or themes attached to their shoes, you have to start making your own shit, I'm assuming, and kind of go in that way, probably, I would assume. But again, it, then you take more risk involved because then you end up with a whole bunch of dead stock of those shoes that don't sell. You know what I mean? It could, it could really cost, it could really, uh, you know, affect the future of your brand. The thing is, I never... Were, were these white people who were concerned about it being racist? Both. Okay. Black and white people. Okay. But the difference... Shouldn't that tell you everything? Shouldn't that tell you everything? If black and white people, or if... More, if not only white people, but black people are also concerned. Shouldn't that tell you that maybe you're going in the wrong direction, <laughs> or maybe this is not the right place for this, or whatever? Shouldn't that tell you everything? If other black people are like, you know what I mean? <laughs> so the situation was, they called me, they told me, they weren't down, they didn't want to do it. <laughs> they were uncomfortable with the imagery. 
Yeah. yeah. And they didn't want to do it, but they weren't uncomfortable with having the conversation. Right. They were okay. straight. That's straight bad. up. And we had the conversation. They said, we're not, we're not going to put these out. And I was like, you guys are kind of wasting my time. Yeah. And I think you guys are. See, this is the thing I don't like about Tremaine. So he wants a conversation. He's not afraid to have the conversation. Converse make it very clear they don't want to do the watermelon sneakers with you, right? They don't want to do the fucking plantation fucking ones. All right, cool. But then he's upset that they wasted his time. That's how collaborations work. There's like a back and forth, there's a negotiation, there's conversations. It doesn't, you know, they, they didn't want to say no outright. If they say no outright, you have an issue with it. If they talk it out through and they think about it, then they get back to you and then say no and explain why. You don't have an issue because they wasted your time. And then it's Supreme give you the cold shoulder and don't talk to you at all or give you those false promises or whatever it may be. That's also an issue. It's like, come on, bro. If anything, this is more of a lesson in learn in kind of reading the room. I think in corporate environments, in work environments, people should need to say things to you. No one needs to tell you, hey, put your phone away. No one should need to tell you, hey, be at your desk with the computer open, working at nine, not... You're at the coffee. You're at the kitchen with your coffee cup, and you're walking to the table at nine. No, you have your thing open at nine. No one should tell you, "Hey, make sure that you leave at like five o three, five o one. Don't start closing your computer at like five, at four fifty five, and then leaving on a dot because it looks kind of bad." No one has to tell you these things. You should be able to surmise and clock it yourself. Some things don't need to be said. And if they are said, it actually makes you look worse because it means that you don't really have any like. You know, you don't really have any like understanding of your environment. You don't really clock things. Things need to always be written to you in black and white. You're a little bit head in the cloud thing. So I think in this regard, it's showing up Tremaine's inability to work with people. And if anything, this should remind you why, again, not to mention him because it's a bit weird to mention him in this context, but this is why Virgil was such a freak. And this is why Virgil should always be celebrated and lauded because he had the ability to navigate these environments. He could always navigate it. Maybe he still had his issues, cool, but he always found a way to make the collaborations with the corporations work. He could always fucking knock them down, right? Whether it was fucking with Bic, whether it was fucking with Ikea, whoever it would be. He, could, he knew how to navigate the fucking, you know, treacherous waters of working with corporations and suits and C-suite people. Whereas with this guy, he finds it very difficult to kind of acquiesce. Maybe it's the, maybe it's the deep down embedded artist in him and just wants to be able to do what he wants to do and have no constriction, have no restrictions, have no notes, have no feedback. Who knows? But it has to be a bit of a to and fro. Just be a little bit of understanding of your environment, who you're in, your, you know, whatever. I don't know. There's a lack of that going on there, which is a little bit concerning, but I guess it is what it is. Aiding and embedding, which you think you're protecting. Yep. But cool. And that's why I never posted anything like yeah. Converse has done something wrong. Do you hearing. ever get the feeling when something like that happens, <laughs> I never you post, ever like feel a like, friend. I'm going to find another I way. never posted anything. <laughs> of course you should have posted anything. They didn't do anything wrong. Why would you post anything? They didn't do anything wrong. And that blackmail social media thing only works once. He did it once, right? He kind of, you know, hey, these, they don't want to put out my thing without my flag, blah, blah, blah. And Converse acquiesced, they put it out. Cool. But you can only do that thing once. You can't do it all the time. Especially off the back of him, you know, looking like a victim or, or you know, pup, using the victim card all the time to kind of get his way. You can't do it all the time. So you had no right, you know, there's no reason to air them out because Converse did nothing wrong. Way to get these shoes out. My whole thing was, it was like that silhouette of the Chuck and then working with Dan and Sky High Farm and telling that. I have art and things I've made with that imagery of the watermelon. It's going to come out in different places. Okay. okay. Cool. Yeah, so it will come out. But again... Did they censor me? I guess, but they talked to me. Yeah. They and didn't censor you. They didn't censor you. Censoring would be they put it out, but they changed the watermelon to a fucking orange. Or they put it out and they censored the watermelon. They didn't put them out. That's not censoring. Censoring is putting it out and then obviously not putting it out the way that you wanted it to be put out. In this regard, they just declined to go through with the collaboration because it didn't align with their vision or their goals, made them feel uncomfortable. They didn't want to get put into some sort of political or social, racial conversation. They didn't want the smoke. They didn't want to be a part of the fucking narrative on the timeline. Whatever the reason is, they just didn't want to do it. But that isn't censoring, in my personal opinion. We were able to have discourse. We disagreed, but it was fine in the end because I respected that 
they have a right to make a choice as a company uh -huh. to not want to put it out. Uh -huh. And they respected me by hearing me out why uh -huh. I feel we should. And we talked about it and moved on, you know. And I guess... Exactly, NJ Ranger. From one point of view, who the fuck am I as a white dude to tell someone how to express their black stories? On the other hand, um, hell no, no watermelon shoes. That's about to make bank off. Exactly. But the thing that's different in this is that you're collaborating with an entity, with a brand in Converse. Converse have their own vision. They have their own ideas. They have their own principles. They have their own goals, whatever, or things that they want to represent or not represent. They're well within their right to decide which brands they want to align with for better or worse. They, they shouldn't always, they shouldn't be, they shouldn't have their arm bent behind their back and forced to work with people just to look like they're on the quote unquote right side of history. If it doesn't align with their beliefs, their, you know, their morals, their principles, whatever, they shouldn't do it. Simple as that. And in this regard, they've already done a collaboration with him previously that was, that went somewhat well. I don't think it was super successful because I think a lot of the shoes sat, unfortunately. But it, it was a great, it was a well put together project. It did actually speak very well to the brand and what Tremaine's story he's trying to tell. Cool. They just didn't want to do that again. That's perfectly okay. And again, I'm not, I'm not too sure if that's again. I'm not too sure if this is a second collaboration, if this is a collaboration that happened at the start, or if this is the same thing happened at the same time. I don't know what, what, what happened, where, where the timeline this falls. But regardless, I don't think Converse should be judged because they decided not to put out the watermelon sneakers. It's not as if they're like anti-black because they did that. It's just they just decided they didn't want to put out that particular, you know, collaboration because they just felt uncomfortable doing so. They didn't align with the messaging. It wasn't something they wanted to do. They decided to pass on it. They communicated to it to him. No, what, no harm done. Because we had that situation with the Pan-African shoes and it, it went well. And we, you know, I was happy with the outcome of that and donating the money to Black Voters Matters and... So that's the thing where it's like, I'm about, not about getting my way, I'm about discourse. <laughs> and then- uh, I disagree with that. I think you are a little bit about getting your way, which is not a bad thing, because that's how you have to be to be successful. You kind of have to be a little bit steadfast and a bit, you know, um, strong and not easily kind of swayed when it comes to your opinion and your point of view on things. But let's call a spade a spade. You are about getting your own way. Come on, Terrain. You know what I mean? You, when you don't get your own way, you, you're not happy. You're not a happy camper. Let's be real. Wherever the chips fall, I'm okay with that. As long as the the talk happens, yeah. you know, I won't be able to be the best husband. Anyway, um, that is it. Tremaine Emery explaining exactly why Commerce decided not to put out the um, watermelon sneakers that he was so desperate to put out, <laughs> which would have been funny off the back of everything that's happened recently with the chicken bone fucking necklaces, the watermelon um, com com de garçon collaboration wallet he's going to put through. I really wanted him to do a hoodie or a t-shirt with like hot wings and chicken and waffles or something, or like with grape juice or something. I would be wanting him to do like a, to really go hard in the paint and do something like that. Um, I was actually even more surprised when I didn't see him collaborate with Andre 3000. He did the collaboration, I think with, um, what do you call it? Um, what, what's it been called? Ceramic something. I forgot the fucking name of the brand. I was actually surprised that Andre 3000 didn't collaborate with Denim Tears in that regard and do some sort of like super high powered, uh, <laughs> uh, black, <laughs> black power, type of collaboration with Andre 3000. But regardless, I, li I like Denim Tears still. I still like Tremaine. I think he's a necessary um, person within the scene and within the industry nowadays, especially considering he's come up and shit. Um, I like the way he does things. I like how unapologetic he is and the way he does things. I don't maybe ag ag agree with the approach, but I do appreciate his presence. And I think it's incredibly, incredibly valuable, incredibly necessary nowadays, given the landscape of design, given the landscape of streetwear, given the landscape of fashion, um, and just given the landscape societally and culturally going on right now someone that looks and talks like him is incredibly necessary nowadays and definitely gives a lot of kids coming up um something to aim for and an example of like what you can do if you have the right kind of idea vision and you kind of steadfast in the things that you do going forward so i don't have an issue with that in the slightest so big up tremaine big up tremaine cool little interview there check it out rick rubin and tremaine talking about all those good stuff